Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Chairperson. Um, looking at the title this afternoon, envisioning another Malaysia, a nation built on equality, is equality for all. I think from the word go, it implies that there are problems with equality that need to be addressed here. And my apologies, I was not able to be here this morning. So if some of the things that I say now has been uh, said in the, in the morning, I apologize uh, for that. Okay, when we speak about equality, uh, equality of all persons before the law is enshrined in our federal constitution. Article 8, one and Article 8.2, and Article 8.5 uh, allows for positive discrimination in favor of regulations for the advancement of Orang Asli. So my paper really will be speaking about indigenous rights. That's the uh, main research that I work on. I work a lot with uh, indigenous communities. So I'll be speaking from the perspective of indigenous peoples, uh, indigenous legal traditions. So when we look at Article 8.5, um, we're looking at uh, what some people will refer to as an exception to the rule of equality before the law. But I would like to say that uh, it, is, it actually lays a more holistic foundation for, uh, uh, for a more humane and right way of dealing with vulnerable, uh, with a vulnerable and marginalized population. So it's not really an exception in, uh, uh, as such, but to look at the uh, vulnerable section of the community and uh, to deal with them at where they are. And uh, of course, the uh, Article 153, Article 161, I know in, in the report on, what is it, washing the tiger, is it? Um, there's a lot being said on this and a lot being said about why we should repeal this and there should not be those uh, provisions. Um, I think um, we need to look really at what we mean by equality again. Non-discrimination and equality are two sides of the same coin. We often speak of uh, non-discrimination um, when we speak of equality. It is true that distinctions in treatment between people can encourage undesirable discrimination and it can produce tremendous inequalities depending on how it is being implemented. I do acknowledge that equality can be undermined if the law sanctions differential treatment. However, it is also true that differential treatment, it's also true that uh, differential treatment can sometimes be necessary to produce equality. And in some instances, instances, distinctions in law are not only acceptable, but they become the means by which we need to achieve our equality ideals. And I think that is where all these other provisions will fall into place. Now, I want to refer to a, a Canadian case in which uh, the Justice Jacobi uh, observed, what is the meaning, he said, of true equality? He says, true equality does not necessarily result from identical treatment. He went on to note that formal distinction in treatment sometimes, or will sometimes be necessary to accommodate differences between individuals, and thus produce equality in the substantive sense. Correspondingly, a law which applies uniformly to all may still violate a claimant's equality rights. And I think in the case of indigenous peoples, very often a law that is applied across the board without looking at differential uh, treatment or looking at the actual state of affairs can 
lead to inequality. Differential treatment does not always signal a denial of equal benefit and protection of the law. All right, now you have that there. And I think the important thing is to remember that you are looking at a contextualized situation. We must always look at the right at issue, a person's socioeconomic status, and that of comparative groups. That is something that we really need to think about in terms of uh, uh, implementing these laws. Now, international legal principles also support the notion that equality can accommodate appropriate differential treatment. Uh, in as early as 1934, the Permanent Court of Justice dealt with the issue of discrimination in its opinion concerning minority schools in Albania. And it held that a subtle form of persecution comes from measures which denies any members of a minority the capacity to be different from the majority, namely where they are forced to their disadvantage to be the same as the majority. I want to just uh, uh, flesh this out. I know this is too, much, too many words here. Basically, uh, Judge Tanaka in the case of Southwest Africa referred to the meaning of discrimination in his famous dissenting judgment and uh, he said, to treat matters equally in a mechanical way would be as unjust as to treat equal matters differently. To treat unequal matters differently according to their inequality is not only permitted but also required. And he goes on to say that the principle of equality does not mean absolute equality but recognizes relative equality, namely differential treatment proportionately to concrete individual circumstances. Again, you are talking about context, you're talking about the people that you're dealing with. Now, this position that the principle of non-discrimination both require equal treatment of equals and the consideration of differences in ass assessing the need for differential treatment, this is also accepted in the International uh, Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. It does provide that there can be preferential treatment for special cases. It, it doesn't, across the board, just says there's no preferential treatment there as well. So we need to look at that. Now, if there is sound reason for implementation of indigenous legal traditions that require some degree of differential treatment to allow them to flourish, it is not inconsistent with the provision of, the, of our Constitution, neither is it uh, inconsistent with international human rights law. I think that is where I want to uh, really build on, basically to talk about uh, rights of indigenous peoples, as Mr. Tan has already talked about, he's given you the case studies, and I think one of the main reasons why you see so much of inequality there is the fact that we do not really recognize the legal traditions on which these people have based their, their laws on which they live, and we do not recognize uh, the customary laws on which their rights are based. I think uh, it is important for us to see that. And uh, you can see in the um, uh, International Convention all this recognition for respect of indigenous rights, to ensure that they have dignity, to ensure their effective participation. And uh, this is something that uh, you can see that under the convention, indigenous peoples fall really within the uh, convention. And um, the committee especially calls upon state parties to recognize the rights of indigenous people to own and to develop their lands. Now, this is a big problem in Malaysia, but I think until the uh, indigenous legal traditions, include, including customary laws, are given their rightful recognition and proper interpretations, the implementation of laws will continue to be one that is discriminatory against indigenous people in this country. Now, there are people in, in, the, in the states, for example, in some of the states who will say, where is the discrimination after all? For example, in Sarawak, the, the statement is made, after all, only natives can hold NCR and, and Chinese can only have mixed zone land. And, uh, and 
I think it's missing the point completely and you are not really looking at the basis of uh, the claims of uh, these people. Now I want to just look quickly at some of the laws that we have, the common law cases that uh, have recognized the rights of indigenous people. You'll see the very basis of recognition comes from the fact that equality is one of the basis, one of the first basis for recognition of their rights. It was the need to recognize the special and unique perspective to land based on native practices. And you see this whole thread that runs through all the cases that recognize uh, native title or native customary rights. It's equality and, and recognizing that they do have a unique perspective and we need to recognize that. I think the problem, what I'm getting at here is that uh, you come to Mabo number two, which really pretty much influenced the way that the, the law has developed in this, in this land. And uh, Ma, uh, Bato Bagi, the federal court, did say something about treating the laws of the indigenous peoples with, equal, with uh, looking at equality in treatment. I think we need to be mindful of the fact that it's crucial to, uh, sort of to recognize that uh, when um, Mabo number two was uh, decided by the high court, the uh, precursor of that, the, the case before that was Mabo number one. And the reason uh, and the uh, subject matter of Mabo number one was the Racial Discrimination Act of 1975 in Australia. This was their way of uh, bringing in, it was uh, the, uh, the vehicle by which Australia honored its obligation under the International Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And that was under section nine. They were not too unlawful for a person to do any act which is based on race, color, descent, and impairing the recognition and, and enjoyment of an exercise of the human right and so forth. Now, once that was passed, the, uh, and the Marbles case started to be heard in 1982, the state of Queensland quickly passed a law, which was the, the Queensland Coast Islands Declaratory Act in 1985. And part of that law said, uh, all islands now that becomes the uh, territory of Queensland are freed from all rights, interests, and claims of any kind whatsoever. It was basically to defeat uh, the uh, RDA. And of course, uh, this went to the court. The state's attempt to extinguish the, the, the rights of uh, indigenous peoples there was held, uh, was held to fail. And uh, now I'm bringing that up because the whole basis of that was against discrimination of one particular group who are the, who are the Aboriginal people. And that whole thing of the Mabo number two has become very much part of our law in Malaysia in terms of common law uh, and the common law uh, recognition of indigenous rights. So I think when we look at uh, recognition of those rights, it is important, I think, to look at the fact that we need to move away from a domination of uh, uh, inappropriate control based on presumption that their laws, uh, uh, governing capacities are inferior. And I want to address this very quickly because one of the reasons I think why in many cases where their uh, rights are not recognized is partly because we have taught our students that there is a hierarchy in the law. We have the constitution, you have the written law, and then we put the customary law at the lowest rung of the, uh, of the hierarchy. Um, and no wonder our students, and as they become lawyers, they also think that customary law is just something that is way below and inferior to other, law, uh, to other laws, which uh, I think, it, and that's an underlying and important reason also for officials, uh, when they look at these rights, they look at it as an inferior right, which I think is really uh, not quite right. I think when we look at the, uh, the way in which uh, uh, laws were accepted, in fact, common law or English law was accepted, it is the, the fact that um, we have uh, accepted English law, or rather, let me just uh, put it this way, when the colonial 
people came, uh, colonial powers came, they knew that they, the indigenous peoples had some rights, they had their own ways of governing, but in many instances, they said, well, their laws and customs were either too unfamiliar or too primitive to justify compete, compelling this, uh, uh, to justify uh, the British subjects to obey them. And therefore, the notion that uh, these laws are inferior, these are laws of savages, these are words that they use, and therefore continue with this kind of practice. And this is the kind of fictional hierarchy that is created by reception of English law. And in some way, I think it contributed to the presumption of superiority of legislation, which are often applied in a rough, short manner in disregard to the existence of indigenous people. Now, in Malaysia, of course, we know that Article 160 defines law not only as written law, but also common principles of common law and custom and usages having the force of law. And there is a tendency, I think, in this country to say, if it is not written, it is not law. Uh, if it is not written, it is not clear enough, and therefore uh, uh, they make a distinction between customary laws which may have been uh, cust uh, codified and customs that are not codified. And this is a problem that you see even in uh, Sarawak in one or two of some of the cases that have come to the courts where the recognition of customary practices have been said to be, no, this is not law, this is just custom. It is not written in any of the, uh, not codified, and therefore not recognized. But recently, of course, um, in June 2013, the Malaysian Court of Appeal affirmed the decision of the High Court that established that, for example, the Iban customary practice of Pamakai Manua, which talks about a communal right to the land, the, the Court of Appeal said, yes, there is such a custom, and uh, it should be respected, and it's interesting to see what the state will do with, with that decision uh, when the Court of Appeal had said so. Um, so that, I think, is one of the main uh, things. And uh, when you look at, um, in order for us to move forward, it is essential, I think, to see customary laws through their own prisms and not to subject them to other sources. Yeah. yeah, not to subject them to other sources and compare them and say, well, this doesn't quite fit uh, the common law. And um, recently we had this decision from South Africa, which our courts also have followed, where they said that in the past, indigenous laws were seen through common law lens now it must be seen as an integral part of our law. And I think that is a very important stance, which if our courts were to do that, and to see, see this from the uh, viewpoint of and interpret the customary laws in its own context, instead of putting it through the lens of another uh, type of law, as it were, and then therefore uh, diminish actually the uh, the force of uh, that law. So, I'm getting there now, I'm finishing. Indigenous legal traditions to be given equal treatment. Now, um, this is important, I think, because, let me just give you one example of why or how it can be dangerous if you are not interpreting it in its own context. There's a case that has been, got, that went to the federal court just give me one minute, please. Federal court uh, two months ago, or is it one, one month ago, in the case of Bisi Jingut, went up to the federal court. And uh, the judges in this case, they did recognize that there is a custom here, and they did recognize their rights. But then they said that, well, there is no right for you to transfer the land to some other person. There's no such thing as uh, you transferring uh, land to some other person. Now, there are customs within the Iban tradition where they can actually transfer land to another. And uh, what the court did, I think, was to just take it as a very restrictive, uh, uh, very restrictive um, interpretation. And then went on to say, an Iban cannot transfer his land 
to another person. If I'm, in, if I'm an Iban in uh, Kuching, I cannot transfer my land to an Iban who is in Miri. Uh, I think that is stretching it too far. And then at the end, an Iban cannot transfer it to a Bedayu. He cannot transfer it to a Malay or to any other native. And in the end, what does it mean for natives? He has a piece of land. He's got the only economic asset that he has. He cannot even make use of it. He can't transfer it. He has to only keep it within there as an heirloom. So I think it is important that the judges look at the fact that customary laws also evolve. As indigenous peoples evolve with the rest of the community, it needs to be looked at in, in that, in, in that uh, context. Otherwise, so restrictive an interpretation will really then bring another form of inequality, another form of inequality and discrimination against indigenous peoples. Thank you very much.